Walmart and Kmart. What do two of history's most famous retailers have in common? They were both founded in 1962, are both discounters, mass marketers, and big box retailers. What else? They both took big inspiration from the same company, an early and innovative discount chain called Ann and Hope. Among the large crowds was Sam Walton, who visited a year before opening Walmart. Around the same time, Harry Cunningham, president of SS Kresge, made a stop while opening the first Kmart. Ann and Hope's leadership had a huge hand in creating modern discount, pioneering many practices still used in the industry today. This is their story. The Chase family, Russian immigrants, moved to Providence, Rhode Island in 1912. They had six children, one of whom was six-year-old Martin. His father ran an automobile repair business, but Marty entered a different business, retail. He started out at a store called Fintex. In the late 20s, he opened his own clothing store. His was an early clothing discounter. After the Anti-Price Discrimination Act was passed, most discount practices were outlawed in the states, but Marty came up with several methods to continue business. His store undersold competitors by reducing overhead. Much of his competition was large department stores. The bigger they were, the more expensive to run, which meant higher prices. In contrast, Marty's store was very bare-boned and didn't offer services like tailoring or alterations, which worked pretty well to cut losses. But the excitement only lasted for a brief time, as what came next was World War II. The clothing industry was suffering. Marty was eventually put out of business. For a while, he went in a different direction, land. He bought an old textile mill outside Providence, in Cumberland, Rhode Island. Marty rented the mill to separate businesses throughout the 40s and 50s. One of his tenants was a ribbon manufacturer. After they closed, Marty was stuck with tons of leftover ribbons. He decided to set up a little shop and sell the ribbons for extra profit. This small operation became Marty's opportunity to enter the once again booming retail industry. His veteran son, Irwin Chase, joined him. Little by little, the shop was expanded, stocking more and more items. Eventually, it became a full-line department store. They named it after the mill that brought them so much success, Anne and Hope. When visiting the original store, there were a few things customers noticed right off the bat. The first was the free and sizable parking lot, something that few stores offered. Once inside, they were given a shopping cart, an invention new to the industry. They also had one of the original shopping cart conveyors, moving people's items between floors. The chases didn't need salespeople, introducing many to self-service for the first time, free to explore the wide range of merchandise without being hassled. In a regular department store, customers would be checked out in each department, but at Ann and Hope, all registers were concentrated to the front of the store, where customers were checked out in one lump transaction. Today, this is common, but back then, it was at the forefront. This time, a war wouldn't stop their success, but lawsuits would try. Their prices were extremely low, and not everyone was happy about it. In 1958, Ann and Hope was restrained by court order when they were found selling pharmaceuticals below fair trade level. However, this didn't stand long, as the manner in which the chases discounted was always completely legal. Remember the Anti-Price Discrimination Act? Well, that was partly enacted to stop distributors from giving unfair discounts and it forced modern discounters to find more creative ways of cutting prices. Ann and Hope ran a loyalty program, through which they gave customers trading stamps with cash value. By carrying on their tradition of low spending and little company overhead, they were able to sell merchandise at significant markdowns while still making a profit. Across state lines in Massachusetts, a similar scenario was playing out for an up-and-coming rival, Ames. Like Ann and Hope, they were a mill store. By the early 60s, they had multiple stores. Back at Ann and Hope, the 60s were just as successful, but everybody else was expanding and chains were running rampant. In the face of growing competition, the chases rolled out plans for more Ann and Hope stores. 
1962, they opened their second store in Warwick. In Rhode Island, discount department stores weren't as prevalent as in neighboring states, and it gave Ann and Hope room for growth. They became Rhode Island's largest discounter and widened their focus to the rest of New England. Their third store was the first location outside Rhode Island, in Danvers, Massachusetts. It was opened in 1969, anchored to what would be a new shopping center, Liberty Tree Mall, of which they were also part owner, opened as the first modern indoor mall in the region. Its tenants were mostly low-end, which was to be expected. Massachusetts was overrun with discounters. Ames had over 20 stores, Bradley's had over 50 stores, but the largest homegrown chain was Zare, with over 130 stores across 21 states throughout the East and Midwest. Of course, Ann and Hope only had three stores, but those three got all their attention. They made steady business in both Rhode Island and Massachusetts. The last 20 years had been an exciting time to own a discount chain. If you were a savvy discounter, two of the only ways you could have failed was if you had bad locations or just poor management. The discount industry was growing exponentially and constantly innovating. Everybody was learning from one another. There were big chains in certain markets, but there wasn't an overall king. It was closer to friendly rivalry than hardcore competition, as many of these executives were in the same circles. Such was the relationship between Walmart, Kmart, and Target. All three were founded in 1962, just months apart. Each of them had a business modeled after Ann and Hope, which shows just how cutting edge the chases were. Ann and Hope may not have been the biggest or most profitable, but in a way, their prestige made them untouchable. Marty never got to see its full potential. In 1971, he died at 65 years old. It can't be overstated how key he was to modern retailing. He was held high in the community, rightfully named the father of discounting. Irwin and his brother Sam Chase would continue to grow Ann and Hope. It was a $40 million a year operation. The 1970s had great promise for retail. That was until the recession hit in 73. The post-war economic boom was officially dead. All cordiality went to the wayside, as this oversaturation of retailers fought to survive the economic downturn. Discount was growing up, and now it wasn't so easy. By the end of the recession, business was cutthroat. The third largest in the industry was Zare, which had exploded in the last 10 years, with over 250 stores. The next largest was the Texas-based Gibson's chain, with over 530 stores. Still, they weren't the biggest. One company had been in the lead for some time, and a discount king was agreed upon. The largest discounter in the world, Kmart. By 1976, they had over 1,000 stores, with $8 billion in sales. In the past, it was possible to coexist in a Kmart market, but its momentum was unstoppable, and it was getting bigger and stronger with every new opening. Wherever a Kmart opened, its competition was picked off one by one. Modernization was the song of the 70s. Having the lowest prices simply didn't cut it. Shoppers wanted nicer stores, and only some could measure up. Ann and Hope had always been a unique operation, and the team tried their best to keep up with the times, remaining a strong New England chain past the 70s recession. In 76, their fourth store was opened in Seekonk, Massachusetts. In 1980, over 10% of all retail sales were from discounters, and there were nearly 8,000 of them. Ann and Hope boasted having the largest stores by square footage, with some locations having cafeterias and garden centers. In their malls, they were often the main draw. Ann and Hope competed with both discounters and traditional department stores. Sears was the best of department stores, and Kmart was the best of discounters. But despite this, Ann and Hope got tons of business. They had six units by the end of the decade. If anything, the 80s can be remembered for abundant commercial development. 
By the late 80s, the Northeast had become overdeveloped. Ann and Hope's future success relied on a steady market. This was the origin of many business-ending problems. They began to have trouble during the 1989 Christmas season, when lackluster sales hurt their bottom line, and that echoed throughout the industry. The next hurdle for everyone was the early 90s recession, which devastated many industries. On top of that, the overexpansion of the 80s put the entire region into a commercial and economic slump. People were spending less. Any leftover money was used for essentials. Not much trickled down to Ann and Hope. In 1991, at the tail end of the recession, Walmart overtook Sears as the biggest retailer in the country by sales. This signaled changing consumer taste, as big box chains, discounters, and mass marketers took over retail at large. After this, Walmart began an aggressive expansion into the Northeast. Many local chains were still waiting for the economy to recover. Some were reinventing their businesses to serve a more niche crowd, with more narrow product lines. Irwin, Sam, and the crew decided this was best for Ann and Hope as well, moving away from the department store business model. The company started scaling back, focusing on catalog outlet stores. These were smaller and offered less variety. In addition, layoffs became more commonplace. These were risky moves to make, but they allowed Ann and Hope to continue business. Perhaps the biggest change of the 90s was the rise of e-commerce. Ann and Hope eventually set up an online shop, but this didn't progress much from being a side project. Meanwhile, Target HQ unveiled an ambitious plan for rapid growth in new markets, heavily focused on the Northeast. For many, this was certain death. By the 2000s, Target had a strong position alongside Walmart. Even Kmart had trouble competing. Ames, Bradley's, Caldor, Service Merchandise, and many more area stores died within a few years. Ann and Hope couldn't stave off the inevitable, but they wouldn't go down without a fight. In 2001, they closed all their department stores except Cumberland and Warwick, putting everything into the outlets. They ended up laying off over 70% of their workforce. To make their way in a Walmart world, they needed to get small and stay that way. After converting Cumberland and Warwick, they had nine outlet stores, and they continued to grow these, opening Ann and Hope curtain and bath outlets, which came with a significant online presence. The Great Recession did little to stop them. This new incarnation of Ann and Hope was doing well, but it still needed further growth to support itself. It entered the 2010s with more expansion. By 2013, they had 12 outlets throughout Rhode Island, Massachusetts, and Connecticut. New openings continued through the rest of the decade. From what I can tell, things were chugging along well. That was until a road bump no one was expecting the COVID-19 pandemic. In spring 2020, Ann and Hope was forced to close their doors, while New England decided which businesses were critical to remain open. The government decided that outdoor shopping spaces could be reopened, which included Ann and Hope's garden centers. The interiors of the stores were to remain closed. Of course, most merchandise was inside. The little revenue they made from the garden centers wasn't nearly enough to support the company. Without a steady cash flow for more store openings, things began to stagnate, and their earlier problems reappeared quickly. That June, they announced the closure of three Massachusetts outlets. However, they were clear that despite these closings, the rest of the chain would remain open. But just 12 days later, they rescinded that statement and broke the news that all Ann and Hope outlets would be closed. A local business like theirs just couldn't survive the economic repercussions of the pandemic, in addition to intense competition. In May 2020, Irwin Chase passed away at 93 years old. With his father and brother, he built one of the world's most unique and historically significant companies. Sam Chase still owns the original Ann and Hope Mill and is part of a redevelopment plan for the area. The old mill holds a place in the community if not just for their decades of memories from shopping at the store. There's much to be learned from Ann and Hope's success, and just as much from its demise. 
How could the granddaddy of all discounters fall to the very chains it helped create? One reason was their tendency to be soft on competition. While national chains like Walmart got bloodthirsty, Ann and Hope was more fragile than ever. Still, they fought like hell, turning the whole company on its head. Sure, the outlets weren't the same as the old department stores, but they had to change with the times. The fact they made the outlet model work when so many, like Ames, couldn't is a testament to their great leadership and dedicated employees. But like all things, it was never supposed to last forever. I think their vice president, Ron Dorr, said it best. We are tremendously proud of everything we have been able to accomplish in Rhode Island and across southern New England since our founding in 1953. We want to express our sincere gratitude to each of our associates, whose day-to-day -day dedication to making the shopping experience special for our millions of customers over the years has built Ann and Hope into the unique company we will always be proud of and always remember.